to record to cloud. Okay. So we are recording. Welcome to Hacks Camp. That, if for everyone on the call, is for the people that are going to not realize we had half an hour of a discussion beforehand. So um, we are going to get kicked off with a, a 101 on uh, what are web components and a hello world so that we all have a common understanding of what are web components. Now, does anybody want to drive not named me? That would be fantastic. I wasn't driving for what are web components. Anybody at all? Bueller. Bueller. All right. It looks like I'm going to drive for, for what are web components if no one else has any burning desire to do so, which is perfectly fine. So um, I have a few slides from, uh, from the Perio talk I did yesterday. And then by few, I mean, it's, it's five. In fact, in it, it says this is going to be web components in five slides. So, so we're all on the same page as to what, what web components are. Um, for context, our team has built at least 400, if not 500 at this point. Um, we are effectively engineering HTML tags uh, that work everywhere. So we've, uh, we've got these four specifications of the browser, HTML template, custom element, shadow DOM, and ES modules. And if a browser implements those, it is known to support web components uh, with air quotes. So web components isn't actually a standard, it's a meta specification. Most people, when they say web components, they're usually talking at this layer, this custom elements aspect. HTML templates make a lot of this possible, but a lot of people don't really interface with them or think it's that big a deal. It, it is very useful for this to exist, but that's not usually what they're talking about. The custom elements aspect means that we can define brand new uh, valid tags. And so what those tags might look like in the DOM would be this, right? So in, historically, we've had div and span and table and header and head tag and body and HTML and all the rest of them. Uh, what web components does is say that there is a standard way that a developer can define a brand new tag and ship that out so that anyone else can consume that tag. So previously, it was just the you know, power brokers at the W3C and huge standards bodies agreeing upon what the definition of a, a video tag is, for example. Well, the video tag took like five years for everyone to agree upon. So as part of that, there was this additional effort towards how do we get there to be more innovation on the web in a standards-driven way? Uh, so this isn't a react component architecture it's not angular component architecture it is the web's component building block architecture those things can happen to consume it if they so choose um, because you are effectively working at a layer below what the frameworks and libraries historically have run at right if you run jquery on a page or whatever it is selecting items in the dom well if we're adding new items that exist in the dom that are valid dom entries we can query those in the same way. So this is not to say that these work 100% out of the box, right? But um, there's custom elements everywhere. Is, yeah, that's the link, okay. So custom hyphen elements hyphen everywhere.com has a nice little tracking of um, just automated testing against popular frameworks and libraries. And so you can see for example, that Angular, highly compatible, Angular JS, DO is mostly compatible, Dojo, hybrids. Honestly, I haven't even heard of most of these. The one that we uh, tend, to, tend to lean on is Lit Element, and that's what we'll show up. I think we should go through as a 101 tutorial um, for what is in a web component. Um, it's, it's by Google, and so you immediately get this tribalism around Google versus Facebook, because React made Facebook, and Google made lit element or polymer element is another one. And so sadly, even though these are not the same problem that they're solving, a lot of people immediately jump on, oh, this is just some Google thing to counter, oh, this is just some Facebook thing. I only say that because it, is, it took us a while to honestly unpack that that's why there's so much 
turf war in this area because coming into it not being a front end developer three years ago was a little weird. Um, so you see there's Polymer, Preact, there it is, okay. So React is in here, right? And this is all just automated testing. This is saying, can these libraries correctly work with the web component standard? Um, so most things can. The reason that people have some angst against React is literally because of the scoring on this page, which is also a little silly, but anyway. So because we're talking about a layer below the rest of the web frameworks, for example, in say YouTube, if I inspect, we've got all the, and YouTube was one of the larger, more visible properties that Google chose, I think in part to clear up some initial understanding about, or misunderstanding rather, about whether or not web components was this proprietary thing. Uh, Chrome, the Chromium browser was pushing this heavily about five years ago. So um, it, it was a little bit like, yeah, you're telling us all to do it, but you haven't done it. And so they said, okay, we're gonna pick our, you know, one of our flagships and we're gonna go roll web components on this. Now this caused some issues initially, um, which is you know, not really for us to discuss, but um, just as far as Firefox kind of felt like, oh wow, things run like garbage on Firefox. Well, why? Well, because of polyfills. And you had an interesting almost flashback to the Microsoft days where they would push a technology that kind of bends the standards to try and get the industry to bend to their will. So I don't know, you know, I mean, Potter and I have been heavily embedded in these communities. I haven't sensed that <laughs> as far as being why they did this, but I could see how you could logically make that argument um, that Google said, look, this helps us be more efficient. Oh, sorry, Firefox, you know, adopt this standard. Right. Meanwhile, if you have enough seats on the W3C, you can push a lot of your weight around. So that those turf wars have kind of kind of died down. But the the idea is that you've got these tags that sit out here. They are custom element. And this is the custom element aspect of this. Right. Um, part of the custom element spec indicates that this must have a hyphen. So I can't make a tag name called like cool stuff. That is not a valid. Uh, custom element spec or web component. It must have a hyphen in it. The hyphen is also how the browser is going to determine that this is something that it should be looking for a custom definition for. Um, yes, that is correct, Greg. Sorry, Greg, uh, Greg is saying in the back channel that most of Google has pushed through the WAT, WAT, I don't know, the W A T G. I hate having to actually just say all the letters out loud, but. Um, Yes, and now they're kind of smashed together a bit more closely. But um, so there's, so that, that is effectively custom elements, web components. It's that you've got these little bricks of the page that make up what your experience is as opposed to, and I honestly, I haven't looked at this, but as opposed to say a React app or however this is made, right? That's just got lots of section div, A, class name, um, that you would have this not just be a link with some random stuff in it that is actually a web component that would be, you know, uh, Padlet hyphen card or something like that. Now, fundamentally, these are all made up of HTML. So to look at um, uh, a very basic one, I, use, I like to use silly examples. But so to look at um, Meme Maker, which is one of our sillier ones. So Meme Maker, when a user implements it, would look like this. So it'd be a meme hyphen maker tag. And then part of the power of web components, I'll space these out, is one, they operate just like HTML, right? So I can say style and declare a style attribute on it. But I can also define additional attributes that have semantic meaning. Right, so someone can read this and go, oh, a meme maker tag, image URL, top, top text, bottom text. Then as a developer internal to that element, I can leverage these attributes and make sense of them. Now, all of this is JavaScript based. It's, you know, is gonna upset Greg. But um, that is one of the things you have to buy into when you go down this way. The way these new custom definitions are made is completely through JavaScript. Um, 
as the, and the reason that the next thing we'll talk about is uh, CSS variables, and, and it comes up in the same context a lot of times, one of the best ways to get style definitions into a web component is CSS variables. So a CSS variable naming convention is really important, especially if we want our communities to be able to collaborate more, more closely. Um, but we'll touch on that, touch on that next. So what the guts of one of these elements looks like, and this is not, this is not the way all of them look, but this is, you know, think this is the general convention. They're gonna generally lean on and import other things. So you can actually consume other web components, have them as definitions, that are dependent on one another. And that's because of, uh, where was my little slide? Uh, that's because in the web components specification or meta specification, that's the ES modules portion. So ES modules is a critical piece of JavaScript that says there's a new way we process JavaScript. It's modular in nature. And so you can do things like import other modular pieces of JavaScript. So you can do dependency management effectively on the front end versus um, if you've ever used like a WordPress or Sakai probably does this, I know Drupal does, you've got like 50 jQuery uh, JavaScript documents and then you use some magic to smash them together and attempt to serve the user the smallest amount possible. Um, that's in part because there was no modular way of delivering those bits of code really. So, ES modules allows us to import code from other JavaScript files. Um, ultimately, all of the custom, the web component definitions are gonna have a few things in common. One is, so if I wanted to make a brand new tag, brand new tag, they're all classes and they all ultimately extend from HTML element. So the big deal with, with web components in general is that all the browser vendors agreed upon, there is this base class that we all will support called HTML element. So uh, unpacking the uh, libraries versus vanilla. If you've ever heard vanilla JavaScript or vanilla JS thrown around, that's not a real thing. It's just saying the stuff that's built in to the browser. And so the browser standard uh, is that there is this thing called HTML element. And so you could drop this class-based structure in between a script tag on your page, define window.customelements.define, and then I do it a little fancy way, but this could be like meme maker. And then that's the tag name points to a class. And so this is how the association is made in, in across the browser vendors. And this is this whole component architecture notion that's so, that I think is so transformative is that if Sakai or uPortal or Elms implements one of these things, it's in a browser spec way that other projects can easily consume these. So the in the, you know, and I'm, the guts of this start to get a little bit convention-y. Uh, why we recommend lit element is it has a styles callback. So you go, oh, styles, and that's where your CSS ends up going. So a web component can contain CSS, Right, so I've got um, a new selector, which is host, which just basically means self. Like think of it like a, a span tag is gonna have display inline block versus a div tag would have display block. So you can actually set the base way that the browser handles this tag. A gorgeous aspect of web components, and, and uh, this is actually provided via shadow DOM, which is part of that, is look at how stupid these selectors are. There's no application I would ever make where I would write a selector just that's IMG. Because IMG is so generic, it's gonna influence everything. But because I know that this web component is meme maker, it's, it's auto scoping the code so that that IMG call only influences this element and the things inside of it. So you can write way easier CSS selectors. Um, Display grid the only right way. <laughs> um, so the other, the other convention of lit element um, is render. And so it's got a render callback, which returns the inner content of, of what your, uh, your component is. So when this is on a page, and I'll, I'll fire up a little demo thing here. 
so that is a really, so I'll actually turn that into a question, Greg. So Greg posted in the chat and that's so much easier than dot meme hyphen maker IMG. Using shadow DOM, that isn't actually valid. And so that is a very controversial aspect of this. Um, so shadow DOM and uh, Mike, Mike, are you there? We could cover that in CSS. That's probably something we could cover in CSS with your yeah. example thing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll cover that in more detail in, in, in um, the CSS aspect. Um, but shadow DOM is an optional piece of the spec. You don't have to have your elements adopt shadow DOM, but when you see shadow DOM and I'll, I'll fire up this little, there it is. Okay. So this is my meme maker example here, right? And so meme maker has this trolley text over top of an image I've shown before. But if I inspect it in the DOM, right, I get meme maker and then shadow root. And think of this almost as a brand new HTML document. It's not, but people were abusing iframes and there's this standard called <coughs> LTI that kind of was just leveraging iframes as these nice little containers that you have right, that you're pinpricking and getting data to and from uh, other places. Shadow DOM basically scopes everything inside here to just itself, um, which is highly controversial because the, the you know, little snippet uh, that Greg wrote in the chat would totally be valid if not for Shadow DOM. So the fact that there's an IMG tag here, it cannot be influenced by a global CSS uh, selector. Um, that is a by design piece of functionality. And Mike, Mike will go into some more detail about different ways you could, that we've, um, we've gotten around that. Um, some of it is when people get upset about it, it's that they don't understand that there are ways to influence it. It's just, you have to be intentional. So part of why we love this standard is we can have someone mock up. And in this case, right, meme maker, meme maker has text of a certain height that is going to need to be responsive to the image it's on top of. If I drop this into a bootstrap based theme or I drop it into a Drupal random site or WordPress random site, it would be completely borked by all of the surrounding CSS selectors for image or for text size. But because of this scoping, I can reliably drop this new brick into any application and it's gonna look that way. Um, so if we wanna influence it, that would be where we get into CSS variables. Um, and you see, we actually have some in here. And Mike, can, Mike has some good examples showing different A, B, uh, C use cases of how to influence things. But this, we view CSS variables as kind of allowing people to intentionally change aspects of the component. So we're saying this is a meme and it works a certain way. And so, hey, if you wanna influence the text size when we're at a medium response uh, breakpoint, then you can set this CSS variable to influence that specific aspect. So it's much more intentional as opposed to if we would have laid this out in bootstrap CSS, technically someone could write like body figure dot top hyphen text, IMG font size, you know, they could actually access and modify that. And a lot of times people are doing it unintentionally. Um, so this forces you to have intentionality behind it. So uh, this is a lit element convention and we, we really like, we picked it because this actually might end up being the standard long-term. So I don't, like, I don't like using things that are non-standard ways of, of doing the web because it's very confusing, especially for new people. Um, but this is called uh, template literal syntax. And so template literals is this little back tick in JavaScript. And so if you use a back tick, then you can basically tell via JavaScript to write a variable here. Well, lit element uses a, uh, a library called lit HTML. And that is, um, that is able to detect this very specific portion of this code. And whenever image URL changes, it magically updates this exact location. So that is something that isn't part of the web component specification, but basically every library that you would adopt, there's at least a dozen different web component libraries that, are, that have varying levels of popularity. They're all gonna do something like this. 
they're trying to allow people to update data and have it influence the page. Uh, no, that is not vanilla. Um, but this has the greatest chance of becoming vanilla. And that's why, that's part of why we, we went with this um, with lit element. So lit element is, um, I think, 3K for all of it. Um, Polymer, which was the thing that came before it, was about 23K. And for context, a boilerplate React app is like 56K. So when we see arguments about like performance or you know size of a library, we try to go with whatever the smallest thing is that gets us the most, the most functionality here. Um, Apple actually has a proposal into the W3C to make this a standard, that you could actually do um, something like, because basically what this HTML function is doing is it's kind of wrapping this in, a, in one of those template tags, which we're not currently using, but Apple has a standard proposal in that's something like, uh, something like that that would be like, oh, uh, you know, allow this to be processed for attributes or maybe it's not, it's more like attribute, attribute notice or something like that. So while not the standard, we're trying to get this as closely aligned and using the smallest library possible to make this happen. Um, Cause it'll help us. I, I want these tags to live forever. It's, it's a standard. And so the meme maker standard tag should work anywhere always. Um, some other nice things that lit element gives you is um, it gives you this properties section. There's a lot more boilerplate code required in a vanilla web component to do what this is doing. Um, and then we also have some hacks wiring stuff, but not going to, not going to go into that because that's hack specific, but effectively the, the big difference between hacks and other editors like Gutenberg is hacks doesn't understand what it's going to edit. Hacks asks the asset in question, what its properties are and builds the form dynamically. And so you're able to reprogram the editing experience based on what the web component says. Um, and it's entirely on the front end. So, uh, all right, I'll stop that one. Let me see if I can find a, a vanilla one just to close out here so we can see what the difference is. So a vanilla one is gonna implement HTML element. Uh, there we go, drag and drop extends HTML element. So. No, that's not a very good one. Da, da, da. We've got a couple here. Why do we have so many elements, Mike? Here we go. All right, we'll go with this one. So um, this is a lazy import discover. So this is a tag called lazy hyphen import hyphen discover. It is a vanilla web component because it extends HTML. Uh, we have decided via convention to put static get tag. That's not required. Um, constructor is built into the lifecycle. But then if we want to change a, va a value, like change an attribute on the element, we need to have a get base. And then get base attribute or get attribute is base. And then set base and then set attribute. So you have to do a lot of these types of things to get data between the attribute written in line, right? If this was like lazy import discover base equals whatever there's a lot of boilerplate code in vanilla JavaScript to make that actually be a value you could, you could react to and, and utilize internally. Um, so web, vanilla web components in that regard uh, basically just give you a constructor to set up the class of this item, right? So I can set some defaults if I want. A connected callback, and the connected callback means that the, the think of the tag being placed in the DOM. So when the tag is registered in the DOM, this code will run. Um, then it gives you observed attributes. So you can, this is how you define brand new aspects of the tag that it should react to. And then there's attribute changed callback, which basically just means whenever base gets changed somehow in the DOM, run, this function will run. And so a lot of people look at the vanilla JavaScript aspect and be like, that doesn't do a whole lot. <laughs> and so um, it's because you need to kind of start implementing a whole bunch of different things together to get the full picture of why this is such a big deal. Uh, but effectively, every framework is doing something like this. It's got, hey, you put the tag on the page. Hey, you removed it from the page or virtual DOM in the case of, of uh, like React. Um, hey, uh, there's some data that's changed and we have to react to that somehow. Oh, base changed. Oh, okay, run this thing. 
um, then all of them will always do that window.custom element defined. So that is effectively the same feedback loop you go through with every single element uh, that we end up working on. Even things like lit element are just extending from vanilla JavaScript. You know, eventually somewhere down the line, there's lit element extends HTML element, which is why these things are all compatible. As long as any of them do something like that. And by, I say all these things, there's things like hyper HTML, um, uh, stencil JS, uh, skate JS. Uh, there's a couple other, other libraries. Uh, there's, there's Polymer Element is a library from a couple of years ago. That's what we were originally making elements in. And all of those elements are completely data compatible with our current ones. So all of our lit element library stuff works with our Polymer element library stuff because everything inherits downstream of, you know, to a, uh, resolves back to HTML element as a base class. And so as long as everybody does that, it's all going to be compatible because it just sits in the page. So that is more or less my boilerplate. Here's what web components are 101. So does anybody have any questions at that layer? Like we're talking the fundamentals of what web components are and how we can use them. And so in all of your demos, the, uh, the render function was actually the shadow root. That's the shadow DOM portion of the web component. Which, uh, which that's one of the hardest things to, um, the, the hardest hoops to jump through whenever you're first learning web components is what the heck is a shadow root. And so if you can see as Brian's typing in there, there's a little hashtag shadow root. And whenever he's modifying those attributes, so bottom text, it's actually changing HTML on the fly in what's known as the shadow root. And so the shadow root is what's encapsulating everything that makes up this meme maker tag um, and prevents, like Brian said, prevents other aspects, other CSS from this website from coming in and, and messing up the styling of this, uh, of this web component. Yeah, and you get these little, um, this comment area. This is something that lit element writes into it so that you can kind of know that it's something it's managing. So, I mean, I could go and do this, right? Manually modify that piece. Um, but it, what's happening is lit element is notifying the components inside, hey, the attribute top hyphen text changed. So the place that we write that into the page, update that exact place. Uh, so Ray asks, what is hacks and its relationship to web components? That is like the $10 million corporation question now, isn't it, Ray? <laughs> um, <laughs> so hacks is, and that's the name of, of our, our camp and other things, um, comes from this. So hackstheweb.org has a lot more detail about the editor. If we want to go into that at a later point in time, we certainly can. Um, but it is effectively a web component driven editor. And so every aspect of the editor comes out of these things called like hacks hyphen tray or simple hyphen modal. Um, and hacks is able to, it, hacks is a web component. There it is, H hyphen A hyphen X. That anything that goes into the body area of the hacks tag um, becomes editable. So for example, this video, the video is a video hyphen player tag and the video hyphen player tag implements a callback called hacks properties. So um, hacks properties has this little schema with it that you see visualized here that is basically the bridge between that web components data model and a user interface. So the same thing as before. Right, so this is leveraging that same concept of editing the data in the video hyphen player tag and it updating and reflecting that data downstream. So we've got a whole, you know, build, content building 
engine built entirely around, around web components. And so the big deal with hacks is that then when I view source, I'm just, ha basically we have an editor that's just updating HTML. And so that thing on the page where I just wrote the new title, I can find title out here somewhere, media title, there we go, is actually an attribute called media hyphen title. And so the, so the same thing as before is just setting that attribute. So with hacks, we're able to output really sophisticated HTML in a, what we consider in a, a sustainable way so that this code runs anywhere successfully that, you know, for example, the definition of video player lives. So um, Tom is asking a leading question because Tom knows, but is hacks, does hacks need to be on a specific platform? No, the idea then is because we've written it using the web component standard, it can be dropped into any existing framework, library, or content management system. So we have integrations with Drupal, we have integrations with WordPress, Grab CMS, um, a project called Levendy. It, it's it's just a web it's just a web component. So um, as long as whatever the platform is can load HTML, we can get our editor there, and our editor will output um, effectively HTML. So you think of it as a far more advanced version of like a CK editor, right? You put, you put an area on the page, it's CK editor, and you say, hey, the content between here is gonna be editable by CK editor. Think of loading the hacks tag in, wrapping it around that same stuff. And then in, in Sakai or any other, most you know, CMSs, LMSs, you hit save. Well, it takes the content from CK editor and ships it to a backend and sanitizes it. Same thing with hacks. So our integrations with hacks um, usually revolve around, it's on a form as part of something else, user makes changes visually, hits save, and then it goes to back end, except it's saving web components as well, so that then the front end hydrates those web component definitions and you get your memes and you get your uh, video players and whatnot. So Chris said, what are, uh, what are the tie-ins needed for Open Aquella to launch hacks for editing HTML store in Open Aquella? Would you like to talk about that more, Chris? That's an interesting. That's an interesting sidebar here, but Ooh, got a cough. Um, so maybe we can do that. Uh, maybe let's. I'll I'll go add that to the board actually. Um, the idea of open Aquella plus hacks editor. Um, uh, I will put that on instructional discussions. Uh, open plus hacks editor. I would be, I would love to talk about that. <laughs> um, um, okay, does anybody else have, let's, uh, try and wrap up the 101 here. Does anybody else have any anything they need unpacked about what web components are, fundamentals of them, um, before we transition into Mike's gonna lead a uh, lead Q and A around CSS variables. Three, two, one, boom! All right. That's where we have the, the cutaway. See, Tom, I'll just put this on screen and then you know you can cut away. There we go. Now we're on to the next thing. <laughs> so Mike, do you have a uh, screen sharing capability as needed? I believe I do. Here, okay. let's try this out. Boom. All right. You can see up here. Should be good. Okay. Um, so I posted a link to a, a component theming demo on GitHub uh, if you wanted to follow along with what I'm doing. What this was is an example of how, uh, how you might start naming your uh, or implementing CSS variables inside of your web components. Um, as you're building um, sort of your library of web, of web components. Um, what I'm gonna run through 
is more geared, geared more towards if you were to produce web components at scale across a, for your enterprise, this is how you could sort of painstakingly uh, go through your CSS variables uh, to make sure that you're covering all your bases, covering all the use cases for people to extend and customize your components. So I don't know if I was building a side project, I probably wouldn't follow these conventions just because it's a little verbose, but um, it's a good example of how flexible web components in the different parts of the uh, Shadow DOM spec, um, how we can jump in and, and modify web components. Uh, that, w that we ourselves have built or other people have built. Okay, so let's take a look at what makes up this example. So it's just a one page demo that is uh, X card. So it's two instances of this X card web component. And I just ran a simple web server to, to look at this document. So no, no build tools or anything running. So here are my two cards. This is a card and this is a card. So what makes up uh, this X card? Well, let's take a look in uh, scripts.js. So inside of scripts, you can see that we are um, extending, I'm just gonna back it up there because there's a lot of CSS variables here that I wanna keep in context. Um, so we have X card that's extending from lit element like Brian showed. We have some uh, CSS styling and then we have some HTML. So um, there are no properties yet. We, we're not gonna get into to the properties aspects. This web component is basically utilizing uh, slots, which you can do in web components. So you can basically say, if somebody puts, uh, let's say I want to put uh, a title here, but I don't want to necessarily specify whether it should be an H1, an H2, or what have you. I'm just gonna specify that if the user uses the slot attribute, and uh, provides the slot name, it will just put it in that one region, okay? So we have a slot area, we have a text area, and then we just have a general um, default. If you don't even, if you don't specify a slot, we're gonna put it right here in the like content portion of this X card. Okay, so this is, you can imagine if you were doing like a web components version of Bootstrap, you would have a lot of web components that look like this. So this is very, um, uh, uh, it's not very heavy handed. It's not you specifying properties. This is a pretty um, just a front end web component. And the idea is that we want to give, we want to make it flexible enough that people can modify it. Um, modify the color scheme, modify the font weights and, and everything in between. So how can we do that? Well, I mean, typically what we've always done is we've inspected our DOM and we said, okay, well, I want to style that H2 there. Uh, so I'm gonna say X card H2 color red. Boom, that works. The problem with that is that we, we, didn't, we don't really know it yet, but that H2 is, is actually in the shadow DOM. And what that means is that if we wanted to, let's say style this, uh, this div right here that contains our H2. So to illustrate that, let me inspect the DOM, not look that up, but we're gonna inspect the DOM again. And we're actually gonna see that there's, there's actually a shadow root that's sitting right next to this card that we, if we open, we can actually see that our H2 is inside of this, of this uh, div right here, okay? So what we really want to do is we want to style that because that is the actual HTML that makes up this, this card. Now, 
that is in the shadow root. So if we try to say, okay, well, instead of X card two, I want to uh, style the uh, part title. Actually, let me do this for now. Let me put a class on it. It says title. That will make it a little bit more clear. Okay, so now we have a class. So we want to target that. And that doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because Shadow DOM breaks a uh, traditional CSS cascade that, we're, that we've all been used to. And that's actually a good thing. And the reason why it's a good thing is because it creates encapsulation. It means that I can, um, as a UI author, I can create an X card that I know my users can throw on the page and it's going to look the way uh, that, that I designed, right? It's not going to be totally blown up by uh, some custom CSS that another uh, user had thrown in. So it's good. What it means is that we have to get a little bit more creative in how we override these styles. The one way that we can do that is with CSS variables. So CSS variables is, is uh, part of the browser spec that um, all of the evergreen browsers have implemented. I forget how far it goes back, um, but it's, it's uh, very well adopted by the browsers. And it allows us to put little variable placeholders in. This is something that we've always wanted since the beginning of, of time, whenever we first started styling websites. One of these little CSS variables. So um, uh, uh, like little placeholders, little overrides that we can put throughout our CSS that we can customize. So the way, well, how does that work? Okay, well, instead of using the um, just targeting this selector here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to allow my users to override the color by using this uh, magic CSS variable. So I'm gonna say card dash dash, uh, and we're just gonna name it something unique. Just has to be unique. So this is sort of my convention. Uh, the name of the element, which is X card, the name of the uh, very, the sort of like selector, which would be title, and then uh, the name of the property. And why did that just do that? There we go. Okay. So now we, we sort of given our users this portal to jump through the shadow dom no matter where this element is it may be nested in 20 shadow doms but it's going to jump right through the shadow dom and it's going to uh, inject a property at that location so what that looks like is for my end user what they can do is they can they can um they can set that variable so they can say Using this root selector, um, what they can do in their CSS is say uh, colon root, and then specify the name of the CSS variable, and then the property name, or the property value. And so that is a really, really cool way that we can have encapsulation for our web components, but still offer variability. Okay, now that's, that's awesome. But the first thing that you're gonna run into is, well, I want to actually, as a user implementing uh, this, I want to, let's say, change the, uh, the font size of that. Now, how do I do that? I can't just say, Font size, can I? And then 10 pixels, right? So that didn't work. 
And the reason why it didn't work is because the element author did not specify um, a variable name, a variable with that name, okay? So that's not good because that means that in reality, what we would have to do as element authors is really account for every single variability, right? So even if we didn't want to specify font size, we would have to, we would have to put it in there to allow others to override it. So you can imagine just how many different CSS properties would you have to put in for each one of these uh, div tags in here. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, um, there, there is another specification in addition to CSS variables. There's also called the uh, CSS parts. And what CSS parts allows you to do is instead of using um, like class or IDs to, um, so to, to designate different parts of your uh, HTML, of your markup, you could use part. And what part will do is do the exact same thing that class would do, do the exact same thing that ID would do. Um, it would specifically target like, so this, uh, this is gray right here. This part is, is because uh, we've, we've put a part of text on this area. So we're saying the text area of our component. And so oh, I could change that to green here and that would change to green. What, but, but it does one other thing that class and, and those others can't do is that it would allow me to write a selector that looks like this part. And then that was called text. And uh, color of blue. And look at that. I didn't even have to specify X card. So like CSS variables, it's going to cascade down through, it's going to sort of inject itself through all the, through our shadow roots. So it's gonna allow us to get through those shadow roots, uh, get through encapsulation and style those, those elements, but it's also going to allow us to specify whatever CSS property we want. So now we can do font size, 40 pixels, and that works fine. So that really adds to the flexibility um, of our web components. Uh, let's go to can I use CSS part, part. So the, the bad news is, is that this isn't quite ready yet. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it, it, it's, I, I, I'll take that back. It is ready. All the, all the evergreen browsers use it. You just have to account for IE, which um, you actually, the last time I looked at that, it, it wasn't this filled out. So I'm very excited now. Um, yeah. Safari picked it up. Not okay. I mean, that says 13.1, yeah. so that's not too long ago. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, whenever I first made this demo, it was an example of moving forward. This is how we can sort of future proof this. So I'm very excited that that CSS part is really getting out there. Um, okay. So there's one other thing about getting back to CSS variables that is uh, sort of a more advanced technique. And this is something that um, is definitely confusing even, even for me who wrote this. But this is a way for, uh, for you to uh, put in some enhanced uh, CSS variable flexibility. Okay, um, and let me see how I can explain this here. 
Uh, yeah, see, it's it's very difficult because <laughs> I just tried to explain this on one of our other calls, and I just told it just totally lost me of what's going on here. Okay, so what's going on with what? This this theming. So I'm reading my comments here. So properties that are tied into the theme convention to find a CSS variable. Oh, 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 I see. Okay. So this is, this is uh, more featured standards talk as well. So the question uh, that uh, came up at, at our first hacks camp was, wouldn't it be great if we could arrive at a common convention of theme uh, variable names. And what that would mean is that everybody industry-wide would maybe account for, let's say, 30 to 50 variable names, like uh, theme accent color one, theme accent color two, uh, th uh, theme font size, theme font family, theme font color. And if we all did that, what that would mean is that as your web components transitioned uh, from project to project, they would just sort of magically fit the style of uh, whatever website it went on. So if Red Hat, uh, they're, they're working on a, a web component library. If they use the exact same theming conventions that we did, I could take one of their web components off of their website and I could put it on our website and magically it would have our exact same font, font size, font families, all that it would look, it would look uh, as, as if, you know, we made it and it would sort of magically do that. And that is, I think is a very powerful um, idea. I, th I think that if we could pull that off, it would be a, a huge win for, for web components. So what that would look like CSS wise is, uh, is you would tie in your web component using this convention. So what you would do is you would say, okay, well, there's this internal variable. Let's say, let's say top color. Okay, so top color. There's this little bar that goes across here and say gray, let's make it blue here. All right, so it's this top bar. Let's say that as a, as a web component author, I want to say, I want that to be tied into this global connotation of the accent color. This is whatever your main accent color is, what this top bar should be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the background color to, uh, Two, two variables. I'm going to set it to a variable for my, my users to sort of jump in and say, I want to override this property specifically. And then I'm also going to tie in a fallback. And what that fallback is, is it's going to be another CSS variable that's, that's tied into this accent color variable. It's super confusing, but the way that the CSS variable spec is written, for you to have three, this, this granularity of fallback, where um, you, you want to say, well, if this variable is available, I'll use that, unless a user has specified a specific color that they want, then use that. For that to work, you need to follow this specific convention where the background color is at first we'll take that selector or that CSS variable. If not, we'll try this one if that's available, which is tied to the sort of the global CSS theme uh, variable. And if that isn't present, then I'll eventually fall back to blue. So what that would mean is that I could probably come in here and in my root set this to orange okay but 
then another user said, well, in the to do to do in the main, let's let's say underneath the main body area. I actually want this to be purple. So you're really getting to a specified granularity um, for giving your users that are implementing web components the ability to, to make them super flexible, uh, to make them super uh, customized. So I know that is extremely confusing, um, but that's sort of a best case scenario of how you can author, a uh, best case convention of how you can author uh, CSS variables to, to make your uh, custom elements really flexible. Is there a list of these variable names that we could sort that's, of start using right now? That's a great question. Um, so uh, what is Cassandra's username over at Red Hat? Castastrophe. Um, Castastrophe. <laughs> So this is, let's see, fast, fast trophy. Okay, so this is catastrophe, catastrophe over at Red Hat, and I think. They are in this wiki here. So let's see. Da -da. Proposed variables. Um, the last time I checked with her, I think this is where uh, she was sort of gathering a list of, of proposals for those, for those theme names here. Um, so I will post that in the chat as well. So it's definitely nothing that's uh, standardized yet. Um, uh, it's just in the, the talks phase right now. But, um, but I'm hoping that, that we can get some consensus, consensus uh, around something something similar, even if it's not uh, a crazy amount, maybe just even even if we could do ten the the idea of just taking a web component from one website and throwing it on yours, and all of a sudden it fits your look and feel of your website instantaneously is and then you tweak it as needed is uh, I think really powerful. So I kind of went from intro to uh, to super advanced in like ten seconds um, for CSS variables and and theming. Um, so I apologize for that, but uh, I sort of wanted to wanted to get as much stuff out there as possible. Well, and now that I've seen you talk about part about five times, it finally makes enough sense to me that I think I can do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's until, until I use it, uh, I'm not going to be able to fully conceptualize <laughs> how to, uh, how to do it appropriately. But I think using, yeah, I think part is a really easy win for, for web components. I mean, um, CSS variables, you can look at it and it, it looks, um, uh, it looks verbose, and CSS parts doesn't. Um, so, it, I think for for new users getting into writing web components, CSS parts might be more approachable. I was just gonna say that I think that parts is a little less e or a little easier to read. Yeah, right. 
I just I wonder what the data specificity cascade will will look like as we start to use them. You know, if you have part mm -hmm. equals text, all right, are we going to have to make sure that then we basically come up with a naming convention where you know we're not then replicating all the CSS variable name stuff where we're like part equals uh, meme hyphen maker hyphen part hyphen text hyphen lower. Right. Just right. so that you could influence the whole stinking thing. <laughs> right. And what I don't know either is can you do this? Can you say title and then X card title to sort of include two levels mm. of granularity? Um, That's a good question. I don't, I, I don't think you can, but. <laughs> yeah, like can something be more a part, part of more than one part? Right. Uh, and uh, hmm. CSS parts can, can be way more uh, complex than that too. You can extend parts from other subcomponents. You can have a component that encapsulates another component and you, uh, you surface that components, all of those components parts. And like to, to sort of prefix it, it's it can get rather, rather complex as well. <laughs> so this is the easiest one, the way to, to implement them. Any? Uh, does anybody have any experience writing CSS variables or any questions uh, surrounding them? It's it's uh, it's definitely uh, a convention that takes some takes some getting used to whenever you introduce the shadow root and not being able to write your normal CSS anymore. I have not had that issue, Mike, because I do not style anything nicely, is what I'm told. Nice. <laughs> That's accurate. Uh, that is accurate. I was reading through the, the part spec document thing. There's also a theme selector, which doesn't appear to have had quite the momentum that part has. But right. um, in said right. document, they start to get into like, export parts and i just that i guess yeah lost. that's what it was um uh who's who's norwal at um at chrome at google i'm not sure uh, she did the um emoji rain hmm. oh 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 yeah um me monica Monica, not Waldorf. Uh, I is she wrote the screen name is. Oh. CSS part theme. Yeah, I, I don't. This is the best theme. explanation of the spec that I've ever seen. I'll post it in chat. Oh, and she updated it quite recently. Um, you can see why people uh, tune out and don't do this because we're, <laughs> we're having a spec. We're having a spec work conversation. Right. Um, yeah. Because you're talking about something much lower level than, hey, I just want to write this little component and be done. Yeah. And it's a brick in it's a brick in React, and I don't have to think about this stuff because I need to work yeah. on my bricks. But you can certainly see how that emerges. Um, all right, let's see. So we have um, web-based editor. Got, let me do this thing. We've got two other things marked as up next year. Um, mm -hmm. Where are you? There we go. 
Um, so one is Mike's R coder processing thing um, as an example of front end and back end decoupling and doing some, just solving a cool instructional problem. Um, and the other one is web editors, um, which I believe was Chris's proposal. So why don't we take, uh, it's three, I got 3.42 on my clock. Why don't we take a break until, or 3.45. It's 3.45 standard Verizon time. That's where I always go with. So I don't know what is setting the clock on my computer that three minutes that I'm behind. But um, we we'll take a break until four um, and then we'll resume with um, either one of those is the next, the next one if, if Chris wants to lead, lead that one off or to give Mike a break. <laughs> but um, all right, you are- Sounds good. You are free to use the facilities and all those things normal humans do at a conference instead of spend four hours in a single room. So we will hit, I will hit pause on, on the recording and then we will resume in 15 minutes. There's three kids playing Fortnite in upstairs. So if my internet goes down. Lovely. All right. So we're, we're going to start back up here after a little break. Um, I was just browsing the nintendo.com website, given that it's written partly in lit element, which is pretty awesome. Um, so next up, Mike was going to uh, talk about some R coder service thing he's worked on uh, before. It's a pretty awesome web component and really good example, I think, of um, like micro front ends types of approaches and how we can decouple and get away from our our giant silos that we used to have. Uh, that big sticker behind me, it's a giant silo. So trying to be more agile in the way that we build out our applications. Um, so with that, Mike, Mike, is that enough of a setup for the R coder? That is a wonderful introduction, thank you. I mean, it's a beautiful jersey you have in the background. Too. <laughs> okay. All right, so the the question of you know what the practical use cases of web components um, is it is it just theming um, or does it have anything to do with functionality? Are there problems that it can solve beyond uh, just theming? And um, I want to show you an example of where I think that we can start moving away from monolithic design architecture of, you know, I, I need, I have to have an LMS, I have to have a CMS because how else am I going to uh, provide functionality uh, in my, in my sites? Um, I think that web components uh, could be a way of you to start hollowing out portions of your uh, monoliths and replacing them with really discrete uh, pieces, really discrete web components that have a very specific purpose uh, and uh, can be really easily ruled out to, let's say, a static site. So in this case, um, let's say that we have an example. We have, we're working on a, uh, a course. Um, we, we want this to be sort of like an open educational resource. This is a static site where we're going to have different lessons, um, uh, maybe different like coding topics, uh, coding languages. And we want to be able to provide tools to allow students to um, sort of play around with code easily. So that's, that's a pretty big ask for any one uh, system. So if you were to go to your traditional LMS, hey, I want an area where students can play around with R code uh, right in my lesson. How can I do that? That's a super specific ask. So, what if we offloaded that to web components? What would that look like? So here's our static site. Um, this is a site that I made in 11D, which is a static site generator. And it allows you to write little markdown files and it generates a static site for you. So in this case, we have a page that we started for R code. So if you're unfamiliar with R, it's just a statistical, uh, software uh, language. Um, it takes 
a uh, um, a binary to run. So you need infrastructure to run this. You can't just have, uh, I mean, you, let's just say that browsers can't do this, even though they potentially can, but we're not going to talk about that right now. But let's just say that you need a server that knows how to process our coder for this to work at all. So what we have right now is we have just a page that has some code on it that you just read. It's not interactive at all. Um, we really want to improve the student experience here. So what I would like to do is I'd like to see if we can put a little code editor uh, in place of that to allow students to uh, write our code and try it out. Well, it's gonna take two things. It's gonna take a web component that provides a visual front end uh, experience for the students. So let's see if we can get that working. Luckily, um, luckily for us, I have uh, worked up a, a web component that does just that. So it's called R Coder. So I'm gonna change the, the, the pre-tags here and the pre-tag is just a way for you to render uh, code to the page. I'm gonna replace that with R Coder. So this is a custom web component, or it's a web component, all web components are custom, um, that does two things. It, it utilizes, and let's take a look at what this is. So here we can see that it is a, um, uh, the, the Monaco editor from VS Code. Um, that is allowing us to, to edit uh, the code. And then it also has this process button, which is grayed out. If I inspect that, let's see what that looks like under the hood. So we have our coder here. So we were talking about the shadow DOM before. So here we can see what's known as the light DOM. So the light DOM is exactly what you see right here. That is um, what gets spits out, what gets spit out to the page. And we have the shadow root right next to it. And the shadow root has two things. It has a code hyphen editor web component, and it has a paper button web component. So this is an example of how we can use component architecture to start layering web components on top of each other. Um, to create really rich experiences. So I did not write this code editor. I mean, this uh, took a lot of someone uh, a lot of time. So code editor actually implements Monaco editor. Hey, there's that Monaco. There's that Monaco editor, <laughs> um, which is its own project, right? So code editor leverages Monaco to, to provide a custom experience. Um, and it, what it does is this web component grabs whatever's in the light DOM and it injects it into the Monaco element and you're presented with a little code editor right in your browser. So without a lot of knowledge, um, without having to go out and download a lot of plugins, we have this, this pretty cool tool running in our browser. So that's awesome. Hey, can you, um, Mike, can you show uh, where that's actually pulled into our coder? Because I noticed we didn't, we didn't actually said where you get these from. I skipped the whole like, hey, we get these from NPM and what that what that looks like. Yeah. People are not familiar. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like inside of LR, you thinking? Uh, yeah, yeah. Inside of the R coder tag, just what it looks like for leveraging yeah. and reusing that tag. Because I think it's a, it's an important point that we end up glossing over a lot of times once we start doing it. <laughs> yeah. So um, Brian and I, uh, as well as a few other people on this call, um, we contribute to a project called LRM Web Components. So it's web components that we use to build educational systems. Um, and our coder is an element inside of that uh, project. So if we take a look at the specifics of our coder, so we see here's a, here's the uh, here's the root of our coder. So it's broken up into a few different pieces. Uh, the HTML, which 
what we do, what we do uh, when we author these is we sometimes break out the whatever's in that render function that we talked about before. So whenever we write uh, the render function in our uh, web components and put HTML in it, sometimes we break those out into its file and have the compiler uh, compile those into uh, the render function here. So maybe for uh, for ease of just explaining it, maybe I'll just look at the compiled file. Right. So this is the R coder element. So as you can see, it extends lit element. It has just a few um, CSS properties here for you to override, like we talked about earlier with CSS variables. So the users can customize the, the height and width of this. They can customize the uh, margin of the button. Um, and it utilizes that code editor, uh, that code editor tag. Now, how did I, how did I get that code editor? Um, is we are importing that code editor using the ES module spec that was, that we talked about before. So as soon as this R coder tag spins up, it's going to import our code editor tags. It's going to import our paper button, um, tag so that we can use them in our web component. So this is components, implement components, building on top of, of one another. Okay. So in addition to, um, so did I, did I explain that? Okay. Um, of, of what makes up our coder, um, and, and how those tags, um, are pulled into our coder. And you, did you show the package JSON? Sorry. I uh, okay. Finding yep. links as well as to where that comes from. Yeah. Not, I'm not saying don't, you don't have that yarn installed or whatever, but. Um, so the question is like, how do we import these? How do we merge each other's uh, web components? So, if Brian creates a web component, how can I use that in my web component? Um, and the answer right now is that we're publishing everything to npmjs.org. Uh, um, it's a package manager for, for Node projects, uh, or for JavaScript projects, I'm sorry. And this is, this is how we're, we're naming them. So under the LRN Web Components group, organization, uh, you can find it under R hyphen coder. So if I wanted to bring in the code editor, I would add the LRN web components code editor as a dependency of R coder in my uh, package.json file. So this is your dependency management for your web components. So you can see this relies on, on projects, code editor, the Polymer, the paper button uh, component, and the uh, Polymer um, base class. Okay. Now, how do we publish our coder? Um, we use a, a tool called Lerna to publish our entire library of components. So it's, um, if, I, if I go back one, and list out all of our elements underneath of web uh, LRN web components, you can see it. So we have a tool called Lerna that uh, assists you in publishing these at scale. So if you go to our, I think, let me see if this is published yet. Our coder, and I search for that. Oh, it's not showing up. Yeah, I was just looking for it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to our coder. Maybe we didn't publish it. That's odd. <laughs> oh, you know what? Um, okay, I see what the issue is. So in the package.json for it, it has private true, which means Lerna won't publish it. Interesting. I don't know why we actually put that flag in there is it like yeah directly to penn state resources or something no all right so all right so, so now there's a lesson in publishing there you go. this is how stuff gets up on npm <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, so we will publish that. That's that's funny. Um, uh, but uh, here, in any I'll, event, somehow I'll do it right. I'll not, do it right. Now not quite I'm sure talking. now. Yeah, do it right now. Do it live. Somehow <laughs> I got it into this this example here. Um, so uh, anyhow. Um, Getting back to the to the actual implementation of R coder, uh, the, so we solved the we solved the first piece, which was web components helped us solve the front end piece, which was awesome. The back end, um, this is something where uh, I think that web components and paired with uh, some really cool back end services could be a, a winning combo. What I mean by that is if we uh, if we used Docker to uh, publish a uh, container that, that processes our code and we taught our web component how to talk to that uh, server, what you have is a super decoupled um, microservice that you can just start throwing on any website. And you, as long as it's pointing to a running um, uh, container that 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 it knows about. So as long as the R coder web component can talk to the R coder backend service, um, uh, it, it just works. So that that ease of implementation of how do I get a complex service like this into an into uh, an LMS? That's that's a lot of work. But if it's well, the LMS doesn't really even need to know what this R coder service is that is a pretty cool prospect. Um, so what, what we have in addition to the R coder, we have an R service. R service. Um, image here that's on Docker Hub. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run this service. I'm going to copy the, uh, the command there. And I'm going to run that service just locally here on port 3000. So how does our coder know how to talk to it? Well, let's, let's actually look at the code again one more time. So if you look at the code, you can see that, let's see, where are the properties here? So it has hacks properties. Okay. So like we talked about before with web components, they can have properties. So think about properties as an API for your web component. So we are defining endpoint as part of the API for this R coder. So we're saying for this thing to work, it just needs to know about this endpoint. If you have the endpoint right, the web component will take care of the rest. So let's specify the endpoint for this web component. So what did we say it was running at localhost 3000? So I'm going to say HTTP localhost or 3000. Yeah. So once I do that, let me go back to this page. So now you see that that process button isn't grayed out anymore. And it's not grayed out because in the background, the web component actually pinged that service. Uh, it knows how to communicate with that backend. So we'll say R uh, no, it's going to be at Uh, it's here somewhere. These are all listed in the XHR. But anyhow, uh, no, not you. So it first pinged, first ran that, which pinged our service. It saw that it was running, which now allows us to hit process and we see the output of that R code. 
So to illustrate that this actually works, uh, let's do 300 hit process. And we can see the output of this code. If we just say print the world, you see that it is actually, it's, it's running our code behind the scenes and coming back with the response. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty cool way of how you can think about leveraging web components to solve not only these complex front end issues, like how to provide an editor um, to the front end easily, uh, with which in this case is just a tag, um, but you're also solving the complex back end uh, and implementation problems. Um, so that's what, as we're moving forward as systems authors, I think that we can start uh, thinking about web components as a methodology for decoupling functionality from our existing uh, monolithic LMSs and CMSs and, uh, and systems. Um, so does anybody have any questions about um, how we built our coder about the the text editor about um, you know that that sort of microservices approach um, or just just anything uh, any questions about the web components that you saw here where would one get the source for the R coder? Yeah. Um, so we have it published under Elmsalin here and in uh, Web. I threw it in the chat, um, but oh, as Mike go. was talking, I also published it to NPM. Apparently, two of our 200 some odd web components were not published and they were both by Mike and they both used this interesting services approach. <laughs> um, so Mike hadn't published our coder, which he's demoed a dozen times and um, glossary, glossary term or glossary mm. service or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you did it because initially you actually were directly pointing to Penn State resources in the code and not that it would work for people, but you just didn't. Right. Yeah, there, probably. Actually. Yeah, I imagine it's up there, and then I pasted it um, in the chat. Ray, um, our mono repo has oof, like two hundred and eighty or so different uh, web components that we deploy from there. But you can search for them on either webcomponents.org has a lot of ours, not all of them, because you have to manually go to it, um, or uh, npmjs.com. Um, and you search for at LRN web components, it should come up with a lot of results. Yeah, so the abstraction here that we're talking about is really as soon as, as soon as um, our web component understands uh, the endpoint that the endpoint variable, uh, it's going to start pinging it to make sure that it's that it's active and running. Um, and this is all it's doing. It's just saying, hey, whenever the value, um, or I'm sorry, whenever the button is pressed, and where does that happen? Yes, whenever a click event happens, I want you to run this process, which it then asks the editor that it, it knows that the editor is there. So it says, hey, um, editor, what's, what's your current value? Puts that into a post request and sends it to that endpoint and then um, gets whatever is returned and, and, and outputs it to the screen. So it's really not doing a whole lot, but the, the pattern is, uh, is very cool. Which even in, so in the source of what we're looking at here, this is illustrating a couple of wins for just the standard in general. So the dynamic, <clears throat> a lot of times we'll do that dynamic import part in the constructor. 
which helps the page not be delayed by getting the dependency tree of say code editor, which code editor is like 500 K. So a dynamic import helps the screen start to load, helps re re uh, reduce that time to first paint and flash up on style content. Um, but the other interesting thing with that is uh, if you scroll up a little bit, Mike, where you had the, the render function, um, yeah, this is actually demonstrating compatibility across web component libraries. So code editor is in lit element. It's importing an editor that's in, uh, that's Monaco editor, which is vanilla JavaScript. Um, that's a wrapper on top of a Microsoft web library for the VS code editor itself. Mm -hmm. Then there's a paper button. Paper button is written in polymer element, but in paper button, the way that Mike's implementing it, he's using lit element conventions to call and pass data to it. So that doll, um, the question mark in front of disabled is Boolean telling lit element evaluate this and do data binding in a Boolean manner. So he's actually data binding from lit element into a polymer element and it's going to work flawlessly. Um, similarly on the click event side, the at symbol means you know, it's a effect, effectively a add event listener is what that's doing as a shorthand. So he's adding a event listener in a lit element syntax, but he's applying it to a polymer element. And then in the end, he, uh, when he gets that click, he's querying the shadow, the shadow root, um, which another advantage to having elements that have shadow root, you can do this dot shadow root and effectively um, do the same type of, you know, if you're used to jQuery, your global scope, uh, yeah, there you go, get element by ID, right? So just focus on the shadow root of this element, then give me the ID of editor, and then just calls the value out of it. So that's actually a very vanilla JavaScript call towards the bottom there, um, you know, and then the async await with a, with a fetch, which is awesome. I need to start doing that with everything personally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's what what we've really been trying to do is is trying to um, use as much vanilla JavaScript as possible, um, you know, within reason, basically, because we want to always be, you know, positioning ourselves in the future. Okay, what if we, is this something that we have to migrate away from? Um, you know, should we use these conventions or should we use at event listeners? So those those are the type of conversations that we have at like code review. Um, so we could, you know, make a determination of, yeah, it probably would be best to use event listeners, but you know, this is so clean um, that, you know, this would, we'll take the developer experience over uh, writing the, you know, standard uh, vanilla JavaScript convention. Cool. All right. So thank you, Michael. Um, let me see. Let me not be a disembodied floating head voice. There we go. Um, so we've got uh, a fork in the road, but only slightly. So um, Chris, you wanted to talk about web-based editors and you had posted a, posed a question earlier about notion of open Aquila and hacks and how that, how that could potentially work together. Um, did you want to have a conversation about that? Sure. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. All right. So the, the use case is really, we don't want to have to have users edit content by downloading a complete file, editing it, saving it, and pushing it back up to open Aquila. Um, and so something like code editor would, would be right up that alley where you point it at a, like a rest endpoint in open Aquila, it pulls down the, you know, I would, I would assume it pulls the, the contents of the file still, uh, but just in the web browser, you edit it and then you click save and it's just, it, it pushes it back into the open Aquila item. And that sounds like it's, it's doable. Um, and so if, if there's other things that you guys have found besides Monaco, essentially, 
um, be interested to kind of start cataloging those because what I want to do is look at building a system that based on the MIME type of thing you store in Open Aquila, it'll pull a different file mm -hmm. editor for you to use. Yeah. So what are what are the yeah like what kind of file formats are you talking about editing? Uh, right now, I'm just looking at HTML, normal text, JavaScript, um, and then just trying to leave the leave the conversation open for further file types. Um, but but those are just the basic ones right now. Hmm. So, so well, I get a ton of feedback from your speakers, by the way. So, would um, the best the best way to demonstrate that be um, like us wiring a web like like maybe we can make a web component called like Aquella Editor as just like boilerplate, and then implement. Um, the code editor tag in it, or you more so want to discuss whether that's viable. I mean, that sounds like a reasonable thing. You kind of take the code editor uh, tag as Mike had, except you throw a file at it ahead of time. And then you save it when you hit a button or something. Yeah, I, I guess I'm more just interested in that the the concept is, is solid and then uh, just your thoughts on best practices in terms of turning it into a web component. So I would definitely make it in lit element, um, especially if you've never made a web component before. It's easy to transition between web component libraries. So the part of why even like Mike had the, at the end there saying like, well, we like the developer experience of the app symbol was um, we've been making web components for three years. The standard by which you made them only stabilized like two years ago. So we started making components in a way that wasn't, we knew wasn't sustainable. It wasn't the standard. It was like a, a, a pilot of the standard. So we ended up building all of our elements in Polymer element and then later having to convert them to lit element. At that time, many of those, I then started to go, well, geez, why don't I see how I do this as vanilla? and converted some of those to vanilla. So um, as far as convention and buy-in, I mean, as long as you're using uh, lit element, we highly recommend, um, so I have opened the, the LRN web components uh, repo. Um, so we have our own tooling called WC Factory um, that we use basically for stamping out our own Mono, it's a mono repo generator, basically. So it's how we generated our stack. That's never where we recommend people start, though. So um, we actually recommend someone else's tooling, and, which is called OpenWC. So if you go to open-wc.org, they have a really nice, they have very simple, easy to read documentation, but they also have a really good boilerplate uh, tool, system, tool chain. Uh, some of which we've started to adopt. Um, actually, part of what Mike demoed before um, running in 11D, he's actually, I believe, using ES, their ES dev server. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, that's correct. Um, which is by the OpenWC people. Um, so OpenWC, is a, it's a collaboration of a couple different groups, but a lot of the people behind ING Bank's web components that they released recently called Lion Elements, um, they, they, this is the tooling they built so that they could make that library basically. Um, but I would highly recommend starting, starting there. Um, would it be helpful for me to run through a boilerplate of how I would make a baseline Aquella element? Um, you know, I'm willing to do whatever. <laughs> it's up to, up to you, Chris. Uh, I don't know. I, I think, I think I can figure that one out. Um, it sounds like the concept is solid. Do you, in your experience, do you have anything kind of like this code editor that could even replace tiny MCE? Sort of. <laughs> so, um, 
We have two things. Well, it's weird. We have two things, one of which I can't fully speak to. I wish Nikki was here because she, she made it, and it's um, partially a work in progress. But she has an element called uh, – oh, goodness. What is that called? It's, she has a text editor. Rich text editor. There we go. So she has a tag called rich text editor, um, which is – is available it's it's all our stuff's published to npm but um so a rich text editor that she's been working on uh i don't even know if it works to be perfectly honest i haven't looked at it in a while uh, let's see you know we must have broke something must have broke something in our tool chain that she'll have to update her configuration there's supposed to be like a nice WYSIWYG that floats here <laughs> so it would be nice if she if she was here to dem demonstrate that, but um, so we'll have to fix fix that. But um, I mean, the main thing is hacks, really, as far as as our text editor. The integration of hacks is you know very much like a, a tiny MCE. Here's this text area and edit it. Um, specifically, the integrations with like WordPress. We actually have a, a tag called WYSIWYG hyphen hacks, which acts much more like in a WordPress tiny MC context where it's taking a text area tag that has the HTML in it. And it's basically mapping conventions to the text area tag. Hmm. Okay. Um, I could show, show you that if that's, if that's useful or. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, if you wanted to show me that and then we could maybe move into how how we could actually launch hacks from open aquella because you know since i heard about hacks i've been wanting to see how we could use that as as an editor that you could then plug in to store the content in open aquella and then you have all the tagging and searching and stuff but um you use the power of hacks for the authoring experience i like where your head's at here um all right, so I'm firing up something called DDEV. It's a Docker container wrapper. Uh, we have a repo called hacks, hacks all the things. And hacks all the things is just kind of like a test bed for all the different integrations that we work on. Um, it's got some boilerplate examples of Angular. Oh, no, sorry, it doesn't. It has a readme that says, please contribute in an Angular one. I couldn't figure it out. Um, but it has boilerplate integrations uh, showcasing React, Vue, um, OpenWC with a thing called Hello Hacks, um, and then there's full plugins for WordPress, Drupal 7, 8, Grav CMS, uh, et cetera. So I usually use that for, for demoing certain tags. So the WordPress integration is very similar to a tiny MCE, and I only know that because the way that the way that you get hacks to work in WordPress is you enable the classic editor, which gets rid of Gutenberg, brings back tiny MC as the default, and then hacks basically attacks tiny MCE to, <laughs> to enable itself. So um, this body area is you know, like WordPress wants to put tiny MC on it, and then hacks jumps in at the last second and is like, yeah, get out of here. Um, but when you save, it treats the output the exact okay. same way. So um, what, what happens is there's a tag called WYSIWYG hacks and WYSIWYG hacks is put in edit mode. We'll see here. And so we maintaining state management, I can get rid of edit mode and I don't think this is editable. Well, maybe it is now. Um, but inside of here, and this is a, an interesting example of a time that we don't use a shadow root actually. So we were talking before shadow roots are controversial for various reasons. Well, one of them, is that if you have legacy light DOM driven code, right? Like a jQuery plugin or tiny MCE that is going to specifically target a certain ID in the DOM, if it's in a shadow root, that's not accessible. So what's happening here, and I think I have the, um, let, me go, let me go to the JavaScript that works with the WordPress plugin because it's, it's specific to WordPress, but it's something that can definitely be uh, more or less copy and paste dumped in for other integrations. Um, CD hacks. Okay. So 
the WordPress integration for hacks, ha there is the hacks the press. So hacks the press he leverages their jQuery hooks, if you will, as far as when to load this jQuery, this code. So jQuery comes in, creates a WYSIWYG hacks tag, then takes the content from the text area that was going to be loaded on the page with TinyMCE and uses that as the default content for inside the WYSIWYG tag. Then it, where are you? Uh, Express a pen child template, no clone. Uh, so, oh, okay, so then it appends the content inside the WYSIWYG tag. And then it looks at where that tag was located, the text area with an ID of content. And it inserts right before that tag. Then it kills the tag that had the text area. So, <laughs> so if you, if we view page source here, I should be able to find a text area tag. Um, there it is. So the text area tag, right? It has class WP editor area, and it has an ID of content. WordPress is dumb and poorly written. Okay. I just wanted that to hang there since it's recorded, but um, there's very poor sanitization to indicate that this is the exact tag right? It's just on, sa on form save. It's going to do some rather minor logic to go, give me the content of the thing I select with, with uh, get element by ID equals content. Like it's extremely basic how it's going to uh, obtain this content in the text area. So what we're doing in here is we basically, I made feel, because I, I made the WYSIWYG hacks tag specifically for WordPress <laughs> initially. So I just have fields um, properties off of WYSIWYG hacks that emulate that field that was in the page. And so what ends up happening, if we go to the WYSIWYG hacks tag, oh, come on, type fine. What you see, what you see is not what my hands would type on the keyboard. So um, inside this tag, it has a text area and then the field class, field ID, field name are all basically emulating exactly what WordPress was about to do as far as having these in the light DOM. So I siphon off those values, kill the original text area, and then, um, where are you? There's a thing that, ah, in lit element, this is a, a very lit element specific convention, but if you do create render root and you return this, that is a way of breaking the shadow root. And by breaking the shadow root, this element acts as it, you know, a lot more like jQuery where you'd be doing a whatever dot append child or dot append. So it's gonna place the contents of this tag in the light DOM. So then, because I've ripped out the text area and I've effectively injected this new text area, I put CMS hacks next to it and CMS hacks is a wrapper on hacks that knows how to communicate uh, and be tied to another tag basically so that it's in a content management system context. So then, you know, the end user just sees this page here and in a normal inner, um, a normal relationship with hacks, you'd hit save in the hacks bar and it would submit to some endpoint. Well, in WYSIWYG hacks, it doesn't do that because it knows that there's some other larger uh, system context, which is what CMS hacks does. And it says, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just put the content here and I'll wait for the page to save basically. So that when you have your content and I'll just you know, move it over there or whatever, and then hit save, it's barely noticeable, but like it, it scrapes hacks off, places the content into this hidden area that it knows is gonna be saved with the form. And then it's actually delayed the form submitting um, so that then when the form submits, it goes through. There's another one that says form helper. Uh, oh no, sorry, that's for another, that's for another, uh, another thing. But it effectively delays the form submitting um, while that is placed in the page and then says, okay, form, you're allowed to submit. And so that way hacks has effectively taken the place of tiny MC without the larger WordPress ecosystem going on here, which is go gobbledygook, um, you know, influencing it. So that's also the way grab CMS works. The grab CMS integration more or less attacks a 
node in the DOM that it knows is going to be there because of 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 um, grab CMS core code. And then when it saves, it goes, oh, I, I found an ID that looks like it's the right thing. That's really interesting. So fair to say that as long as we we make a a div essentially available, however we want to, you know, where do we want to place the authoring experience? We can we can point, and this is still a little bit unclear, but we can point a uh, a REST API for where. Um, well, no, even just we load the contents of the file into um, into a div and then point hacks CMS at that div content. Hacks CMS should be able to then pretty it up and, and give that that hacks experience. And then when it clicks save, we just we we just somehow grab that event and and save it ourselves. Is that how you would? How, yeah, like handle the flow. Yeah, so um, the only the only difference is um, slightly in in wording. So hacks CMS is its own system, um, whereas this would be the hacks tag itself. So hacks CMS mm -hmm. actually does the process you just you just describe what hacks CMS does. Um, <laughs> so hacks CMS is a specific subset of elements that we have. Um, Oops, I didn't need to do code in a period here. So, uh, and for, I believe that's in hacks all of things too. Let me make sure. Um, I, bet I never test this copy, so we'll see if this even works. I'll just go to the demo that's public. I never go to that. Well, I'll go to my Haxium deployment. Um, so this is Hack CMS, and so Hack CMS is providing a bit of a wrapper to it. So if I hit these buttons, these buttons are hack CMS. This is hack CMS with an outline editing tool. Um, however, if I hit edit, this is just hacks, just the page editing uh, notion uh. of what's going on. So, I mean, and that's the, the gorgeous thing with web components, right? We're working on this headless decoupled system that makes the assumption, hey, you're gonna save a blob of content. Oh, by the way, that blob of content, I don't care if it comes from Drupal or WordPress or where it's going. I just care that I'm making a blob of content. So Hack CMS um, taps into the events of Hacks, and I believe it's called Hacks. I can save. Maybe not. I thought it was called Hack Save. Let's mm -hmm. find where the Hacks tag is. It's got to be somewhere in here. Uh, there we go. So we have Site Editor, which is the thing that actually puts the Hacks tag on. Um, and then we did, I mean, this is like the, the wins with web components, like just, Hey, we talked about how to do a, a hello world and all the conventions apply <laughs> to this stuff. So, right. um, so there we, okay. So we have the hacks tag, um, hacks is on the page. Uh, oh, that's right. Cause I have a, okay. I see what's going on here. So I have an event inside of uh, there's okay so hack CMS is a little weird because hack CMS provides its own buttons so we've got stuff in hacks that says like yeah i know you have a save button but like look we're getting rid of your save button it's gonna be my save button and so there's an event in hack cms in this case that is the save button over here because hack cms is supplying the edit like it needs to know hey we're editing versus in wordpress you saw the little save buttons here um, so whenever the user clicks this save button, there's a save node event that fires and the save node event is basically we bubble an event up and this is a good uh, data management aspect um, and state management. So when clicking that button, an event called hack CMS save node is going to fire and hack CMS save node comes from this button being tapped. So there's the edit button in here. So I click edit fab. I have that at click. It says, oh, well run edit button tapped. Edit button tapped will dispatch an event that's a custom event and it's called hack CMS save node. And the, um, 
in custom, when dispatching custom events, you, if you set compose true, it'll allow the message to bubble out um, and through shadow roots. So default for events is that they're scoped to whatever element they're in, which is an interesting concept with uh, this whole thing with, with shadow DOM is that you can have a whole bunch of like scroll by the timer and the timer knows to start counting because you passed it. Well, you can write that code in a way that it's scoped just to itself and it's emitting events just that you know are gonna go to the, bo the borders of itself. Um, in the case of this, I'm saying, okay, well, fire this event. It's gonna go all the way up to the window, imagine. And then in the edit, the um, site editor, which is managing the state of what's going on with this, I have a listener on the window saying, well, when that event finally gets here, I don't care where it comes from, then we're gonna run save node. And the save node function is gonna make sure that we have a backend path, which is set somewhere else in the, in the logic. Then um, we do have access to the, the hack store as a global instance. And so in this case we go, well, okay, window.hackstore.instance, go and look at the active body and give me that active body's content, which is a function we have on there. So that is gonna return to me whatever hacks has been working on and editing in a sanitized form. And so it's just, a, it's gonna be a, a data blob. So then I tee up a Ajax call and I say, well, ship the body off um, to a backend. And in this case, this is some other internal stuff to say, yeah, well, generate what the request is. Um, but I believe in WYSIWYG hacks, um, it's a different event listener. I don't know, maybe I don't have it on here. I wanna sorry, find that hack save. Ah, there we go, okay. So there is a hack save event, which is in the normal, if you were, you know, if you integrate the hacks tag, when the user clicks the save button. So the way that the WYSIWYG hack save tag is working is, extremely similar, right? It's just saying, oh, we'll get that content and set it to the body. Um, and then this cheats a little bit because it clicks a, it clicks like a hidden button, <laughs> basically, to ensure that the form will submit successfully. But um, yeah, as long as you, you basically listen on the window for whatever that, that hack save event is, and then you go and snag, you know, where the custom, hey, give me the contents of hacks body, then you can write, you know, basically any integration. Excellent. All right. Well, that shows me that that's integrating hacks with, you know, once we get the framework set up for editing files in the web, um, we should be able to use hacks for the kind of the WYSIWYG stuff, at least as an option, right? And then people can choose if they want it or not. And this could be a, um, a really, and I, I don't know if this is happening, just spitball in here but that this could be a really good use case for like I know Sakai is working on I think it's CK editor 5 maybe I think for for their upcoming release or for Sakai 21 if they had you know if that was a web component if there was like the Sakai hyphen editor you know or if it was the multi hyphen editor or multi hyphen file editor or whatever that name is that it starts to become something where we can work across these ecosystems that, you know, Chris, you're not just working on the open Aquella hacks integration. Maybe it's like the file editor integration that if you have the hacks attribute set, then it pulls hacks in. If you have code editor set, then it pulls in the, uh, the code editor. If you have CK editor set, right? Like some abstraction like that, but these are conversations we right. wouldn't have been able to have previously. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, for, for the open Aquella world, I'm looking to do it by MIME type. Um, but I don't see why that we can't figure out how to reuse a component um, to leverage what other, other people are doing. So lots so, of stuff to think about, but. Um, so whenever you get around, you get to that. Um, I post a link to our unified issue queue associated with that, you know, feel free to jump in or post questions about that or our, um, our, our hack slack. We talk about integrations all the time. Unfortunately, I end up writing most of them, but I would definitely prefer other people write them. But I, I will definitely help <laughs> you write it. It's totally fine. <laughs> all right. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. 
Um, so going back to our, our board O stuff. All right. So we covered our, I need a, need an, there we go. We'll do the screen share thing again. Desktop. Um, with my little invisible windows out. Okay. So I should probably make like a topics covered <laughs> and move that over here. So we have Neato 101, CSS variables, R coder, I'll keep them in the same order. Um, Web-based editors and open Aquila. We kind of covered, covered both of those. Awesome. Um, Andrew, are you, are you there? Would you be interested in talking about TI render still? I am here, um, and I would be definitely be interested in talking about cool. it. Cool. So let um, me make you a co-presenter or co-host. All right. You now have superpowers. So Andrew works at Penn State Libraries um, and has written a custom web component for rendering TEI documents, which for the life of me, I don't understand. But now that we have it deployed, actually working somewhere, it's pretty cool what it ends up rendering out. So. It's also a fun example, um, I will say, from a, the difference between industry worldview of application building and education and library spaces and, and government for that matter, is Andrew made a tag to render a document that's several megabytes at times. In industry, they'd just be like, well, you don't render the document. You'd be like, well, that's not, that's not an acceptable thing. <laughs> so. <laughs> just for context, when you go out and you see things about performance and, you know, you have people at times arguing over 1K versus half a K, sometimes we have use cases where we got to deliver a 10 meg file to the browser. And so it's, you know, it's kind of a moot point. But anyway, Andrew, take it away. All right. So... You guys seen my... Uh... Yep. Screen using DI and cutting initiative, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I have three desktops, so I was just making sure I was getting the right one. <laughs> um, so what we have here, um, as as Brian was talking about, uh, we have a series of TEI documents. Uh, TEI stands for Text Encoding Initiative, and um, it it comes back to the idea that uh, you need to be able to sometimes identify annotations. You have to be able to identify um, special things about a document. So in this particular project, uh, we're dealing with a text, um, a book from 1647, uh, as in like the year 1647. And it has all kinds of different annotations that have been written in it over the years. And uh, Penn State has had the copy since uh, quite a while ago. Uh, I forget the exact date, but um, it's pretty special because it has uh, a whole collection of different plays from uh, the early 1600s. And uh, it's really, really useful from a uh, perspective of English history and uh, dramatic presentations uh, that cover both of those things. So very interesting content. Uh, could be very interesting to a lot of people, both from the perspective of uh, the materials itself and, uh, you know, how it can be used. Uh, so, as an example, uh, you know, these are some of the pages. Uh, so, this is the, the title page. Um, and then, like, this is a, you know, some preface content. Uh, so that's that's all stored. It was digitized by uh, Penn State University Libraries, and uh, so that's why we have this content. Now, this content is just images. Uh, it's not engaging in any way, shape, or form, and there's not a good way to be able to provide any information about, uh, for example, uh, why do they use the funny S's, uh, things that look like F's, um, but aren't actually um, why do they, uh, what does this word mean in a particular context? Uh, why are they using drop caps? Things along those lines that uh, as you're looking at it, you might not understand uh, all of the depth that is actually involved in 
the typesetting and the delivery of the actual content. So a course was developed that they're going through and generating these TEI documents to be able to provide all of that information in the depth of uh, the documents so that the information about those, those terms and the typography and whatnot can all be covered, but not necessarily get in the way of uh, the material. And so that the material can then be used for teaching and learning about uh, this material and how it applies even, you know, almost 300 years later. So um, this is a, a demo site that we have up of uh, the actual content. Um, so for example, these, uh, these XML files, uh, a whole bunch of information about the cast, and then we have uh, these special TEI fields. Now you'll notice that some of them are pretty familiar HTML tags, you know, you have body of div, but then you have uh, these specialized tags that are appropriate only for TEI. And as Brian was mentioning, these files get relatively large. Uh, this one here, I think, stops out at 7,000 lines. I think the other one's uh, about 9,000 lines. Yeah, almost 10,000 lines. So relatively large documents. We don't want that to be just in the page uh, for a couple of different reasons. One is that uh, we want to have these TEI documents actually true to them being TEI documents, because that gives us a lot of flexibility for statistical analysis of the documents uh, for digital humanities purposes, but also uh, because of the fact that the presentation should be set separate from the actual content. So the tool that I have uh, written is a TEI-render component. Uh, it's up on NPM. Um, So that's where it's available. And the what the actual tag or what the actual web component does is it translates the TEI XML into uh, this format. Now, uh, it adds in some of the things like it does line counting uh, that shows over, over here in the margin, uh, identifies some of the specialized texts that's been uh, formatted in particular ways. It's uh, calling out the, uh, the speakers, stage directions, and that type of thing. It also has uh, line links. So you can click on a particular uh, little chain here and it throws the, uh, the link onto your clipboard so that you can then use that as a means of being able to get back to that particular line in the future. So that one pulled me back to 37 there, uh, which will be really helpful for uh, teachers as they're working on trying to uh, discuss the content and uh, work in a class on it. Yeah, can you reload the page as to, so that it, it forces that to jump there? Yeah. Like if you just hit the refresh button, I think it'll force it. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if we might have to do some some timing work. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. I think it. I think I was running into an error, an issue um, on connection. Sometimes locally, it doesn't have a problem, but uh, sometimes when you do a refresh, it doesn't click to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually on a new page load, uh, it does. So. And that's a that's a good example of where something like import timing, right? So I know we do dynamic imports to get this to load the page faster, but when it mm -hmm. starts, in, it starts uh, interfacing with, you know, the top of the document or with the command line, uh, the, the URL bar rather, sorry, that the URL bar code might execute prior to that dynamic reference showing up. So that's a, it's just worth putting in the issue queue. It's a, it's a good, I, I didn't know you and Nikki added that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was one of the things that uh, the uh, professor is really super excited about is the ability literally to be able to say, 
uh, here's the link for this thing that we're going to discuss in class, and then being able to, you know, jump right to it and discuss the five lines, you know, from 50 to 55, and bam, it's right there. So, um, yeah, so a couple different aspects of that. Um, the also the uh, we have some of the what they refer to as uh, um, paratext, so information about the project. Um, so just some details about it and, and how everything is uh, put together and intended to work. Now this is one particular play, um, and there's going to be a series of, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, two or three dozen of them, and they're all part of uh, the, pro the Digital Wellman and Fletcher project. So that's the content. Now, uh, to kind of talk a little bit about how that actually, uh, let me grab this and pull it over here. So uh, this is the uh, the Hacks 11 um side of things. So the way that this was all put together is uh, I used Hack CMS, uh, which is one particular implementation of uh, building a CMS on top of uh, web components or with web components. Uh, Brian's talked a little bit about that. And then uh, I'm grabbing the files out of that and uh, throwing that through uh, Hacks 11 which is then generating the files uh, generating sounds like it's doing more than it's doing, but um, it's it's going through and uh, reformatting and restructuring the files such that uh, they are completely 100% static. So there's no uh, regeneration of um, of the site in terms of uh, like what you would do with PHP or uh, Ruby on Rails or something like that. Instead, the files are just the files, and uh, they're delivered just with any vanilla web server. So the the advantage in that for our group is that uh, this is a project that we can uh, very frequently in libraries, and I think in a lot of organizations, but definitely in libraries, we have situations where we can uh, we have time to create a project but the time to maintain projects is very, very thin. So as we go forward, uh, this should be able to live pretty much on its own because all we have to do is make sure that the web server is secured and then we're good. The actual content, we don't need to worry about upgrading for, um, you know, back in languages like PHP or Ruby on Rails or whatever else. So, um, yeah, so in, within Hacks 11 uh, we identify some of the dependencies here. Um, so, for example, here's the uh, where I'm identifying the TEI render component. And then after that, then we have um, the files that I brought in uh, from Hacks CMS. So we have uh, about the project. As an example, uh, we're just going through and talking about the project, and uh, we've added on these little bits of uh, gray matter for being able to uh, identify titles and whatnot. That gets all pulled together by Hacks 11 to be able to fill in uh, details like the, the sidebar uh, that identifies the content. Where did my page go? There we go. So these elements over here. And let's see. So it runs through a couple different stages. It uses a couple different templating languages. Uh, Liquid is uh, one of them. And uh, it goes through and, and pulls in uh, various different pieces. Uh, so for example, this is the actual page template. And then it uses the uh, individual items, pulls each one of those in and builds out the actual uh, pages that end up in 
this uh, site folder. So within site, that's where it, it actually has all of the elements of everything that is needed for the entire site. So uh, again, about the project, we have this index.html, just use that, uh, that template and it has all of the different uh, JavaScript files that it needs to load and the actual content of the page. So then all I need to do in order to quote unquote publish it is just get it on whatever server it's going to be served up from. So in our case, we're, we have a, a server that, you know, Apache server that we're throwing it out onto, but um, which is what you're seeing if you uh, if you visit the uh, the openpublishing.psu.edu slash pf, um, which is just our, our demo site that we're working with right now. Um, that's what you'll see is this actual content just thrown out there. Um, but just as easily as we're throwing it out onto a uh, Apache web server, this could also be thrown out onto GitHub pages um, or Surge down to Sage um, or literally any other uh, web server platform. So that is what we're doing. Um, one aspect to, so in terms of the actual tag itself, um, so if we actually inspect that tag, we can see uh, that we have the, the TEI render tag here. And all that's actually being put into that is a couple of attributes. And then we have a, a source of that XML file and then it goes and fetches that actual XML file and uh, throws it into the DOM and rebuilds all of the tags for it so that it looks like something you'd want to read instead of something that you'd want to uh, torture somebody with. So that is, that is the TEI render tag built into the sea voyage, which is part of Digital Beaumont and Fletcher. That's cool. Have you ever experienced where it just keeps reloading and pushes you back up to the top of Act 1? So um, occasionally what we do run into if, uh, and this is what Brian and I were talking about, is um, if on the TEI render, because of the fact that it is such a large uh, file uh, that it's pulling in, then occasionally what happens is the ordering on where it's rendering and where it's loading, then it ends up uh, dumping you back at the top of the page. Um, I haven't run into a situation where it would change pages, um, but like if I click on act one, like initially I see just a white page, then the content comes in, then it gets rendered. So that is one aspect right now that is not great, but uh, it, it could be worse. <laughs> is that what you're referring yeah, to? Or? I mean, and no, I was referring to after it gets rendered and, you know, it, it is what I see on your screen. There's a little green loading bar that comes at the top and I try to scroll down on act one to start reading through it. And then that green loading bar comes up and it pushes me back up to the top of act one. I stay on the same page. Uh, it just scrolls to the top. Yeah. Um, so it, I've run into the same thing when we were talking about the, uh, uh, the line links. That's one of the things that occasionally happens as well, is that you'll get tossed down to line, line nine uh, or you know whatever line you happen to be asking for. Um, you know, I, I request line 110, it'll bump me down here in just a second to line 110, but then I'm bumped back up to the top, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a timing. So that's that's probably a timing issue that Chris is describing because as well, a different timing issue, very similar, um, because there's a, an aspect of the hack CMS theme layer 
that whenever it goes and it detects that a new page has been loaded, it auto scrolls you to the top of the page. That way, when you go between long running pages, you're not like magically halfway down the page if you were halfway down the other page. So there must be some interplay with what Andrew is describing with the line thing. I filed an issue um, about it, but I'll have to make a, another one related to hack CMS and, and loading. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 and like Brian said, I think it's just a matter of uh, timing on that. But have you tried it out in that other pro mode that we have for Hacks Eleven D? I was just curious. I haven't yet. Now. So in in Hex 11D, um, we have two modes. One's the Hex CMS, where you're you're rendering it through the the Hex CMS tag, um, and then another mode where it it, uh, it I think in if you go under underscore data and then settings.js, uh, you can change the mode to like Pro, mm -hmm. and that would um just make it like a pure static site uh it wouldn't do the ajax refreshes between uh as you click through the different pages it wouldn't do it ajax it would just load the page um just like as a normal static site would yeah I, if i remember correctly that was causing a pretty significant amount of uh time in between page paints mm. but yeah i haven't tried that since i put all of this in so try it later <laughs> yeah the nice thing with it pumping out the static pages that are still in a pwa um or a single page app whatever acronym we want we're, we're using this month um the nice aspect of that is it's going to allow us to have a much more granular look at what all the timing implications are of the other components we're using so that we can really trim down the learn to theme which is what that theme is um or just the entire load order of the application itself because mm -hmm. Not that there was a lot of bloat in the hack CMS side per se, but there's a couple hundred elements in one of those pages, especially when the editor loads versus what Andrew has here is just the hack CMS element and the theme element and his TEI one. So it'll, it'll help us isolate where these timing issues come into play. Like earlier today, I noticed that on that page load, Andrew, it asks mm -hmm. for it asks for site.json six times when the page loads. <laughs> so like stuff right. like that, that when when you're in an editing state and I need a fast refresh, I need it to be real data, that stuff is important, but uh, not in a pure static type of a context. I want that file loaded once and I don't want to talk to it ever again. Do you think that that could be loaded in and in, in, into the uh the data settings area? Uh, it could be, or it's something, it, it's probably more an internal logic issue we have to solve, right? Like it, it should only ask for site.json once. Um, now, when you, when you are live editing the site, which is what's happening with Hack CMS, mm -hmm. you need to keep refreshing that because you may have just executed something that modifies the site.json and the whole system's driven by it. Um, but it, that is not something I would have even noticed until we went this static route. So I do love, I love Hacks Levendy, and it's not even fully done yet. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So awesome. It was totally worth not sleeping Monday to make sure that that happened <laughs> between you and I. Um, all right, we got Andrew on tap. We've got about 40 minutes. I'd say we probably have time for one, one more of these things on the list here. Um, did anyone have anything in particular that they wanted to 
cover today or bump to tomorrow on purpose. How can web components be used to improve accessibility for those using I wonder, does it say who made this? Was this anyone on said call? Oh, uh, hi, that was me. This is Corey. Oh, hey, Corey. Hey, how's it going? Um, did you want to talk about that one? We could totally. Uh, yeah, totally let me see, get my camera on. Hang on a second. There we go. So I'm from Oakland. I was on the uh, team there doing accessibility work a couple of years ago. And we've been looking at ways to use um, mainly React elements, but also just any web elements too, to see if we can figure out ways to improve uh, WCAG compliance. That's a big thing for us right now. And we're just trying to make sure we stay up to date. So we're hoping that we can do a little bit about that at this conference too. Cool. So you're, are you currently using web components or are you looking at web components as like a, how would we handle this in an accessible way? Um, a lot, I'm, I'm a former employee. So a lot of what we're doing right now is um, React elements, especially like material UI. So um, DOM based elements, they are using them now. I can, let me see if I can get an example project up. Yeah. Do you want to share a screen? I can just paste it in the chat. Oh, okay. This is Oakland's repo. We mainly use uPortal, so we have a lot of portlets and soffits, and we use um, web components for the front ends for them. Nice. Okay. Glancing through here. I'll throw it up on screen share. Instead of me just staring at the thing. <laughs> oh, hmm. So accessibility with web components. Mike, you want to answer that one, right? You want to solve that? You want to oh, yeah. That, that, conversation? that is an easy one. <laughs> I mean, um, so to, to preface it, um, that was a pretty substantial reason for us getting into web components at the very beginning. Um, whenever we were trying to roll out new themes for our learning management system, Elms, we were just trying to, you know, project out, okay, well, how do we, if we're giving um, instructors tools to, to create their own content and we find accessibility issues, how can we update them en masse across our entire portfolio? Um, and what we liked about web components was the notion that we could change the underlying definition of a web component, change the markup inside of that, and roll it out to a bunch of systems simultaneously. So if we identified an issue with, let's say, the video player, um, and we know that the video player is being used by you know, hundreds of courses, um, how do you roll out a change like that? And that historically has been um, it, it's something to definitely consider. That's, that's definitely a reason why you would go with something like a, um, a, a monolith is because it's just one code base. You can update it and it updates for everybody. Of course, then you have to make sure that you're testing everything extremely thoroughly and everything. But um, what we liked about web components is that we could isolate that change in the video player itself just through the web component tag um, and and push it out uh, for, for everybody. Um, so whenever you're talking about like what the difference is between traditional WYSIWYGs and something like hacks that allows you to author um, in web components, that is a huge win because a lot of times with the, with the traditional WYSIWYG is that they're injecting lots of markup into the body area, which makes it as soon as the, as soon as the markup goes in that, in that body field, it makes it very tough to, to update uh, programmatically. Right. 
um, without the fear of breaking everything. So that's, that's what uh, one of the big reasons that drew us to web components uh, right off the bat. Um, Some of it's also uh, probably reflected in highly specific elements that, that we built. So this is certainly an area where I'm going to just keep saying like, wow, I wish Nikki was here. Uh, Cause she is definitely, she engineers a lot of our, we have a series of elements that are prefixed alley. So like alley collapse for a highly accessible collapse field set. Um, but one of the big ones that she's engineered is alley media player, which is demonstrated here in the video player tag. So uh, the video player that we have actually has the ability to load in transcripts and then it'll scroll through them. Let me turn my voice off. I don't want that to play. Um, but that we could actually jump to points in the video through a clickable transcript. Um, you could search through it. Oop. I don't know what I just searched for there. Um, but the big, uh, another, another thing that's kind of less visible as far as what's going on with a video player uh, has to do with these colors that are set. So the colors are set through a project um, called Simple Colors that's in our, our arsenal of elements, if you will, um, which I believe she has, I think she has it up in our storybook. Let me see real quick. Um, maybe not. Well, a bunch of the alley stuff is up there. I'll have to fire up the uh, the color subset demo. Um, so it's in simple colors. Or I could just have all kind of, uh, wow, I got mad at my node version somehow. That's pretty, that's a good one. That's, that's new. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. That's unfortunate. <laughs> um, she has a really good, uh, yeah, I don't know. Potter, see if you can fire it up while I ramble with this. It, she has this great uh, display of colors and then you can click on any color and it tells you like the things that you can use uh, as a derivative off of that. Um, but our storybook has a series of, of elements that she's leverages over and over again from an accessibility standpoint, like her alley collapse. Um, she recently worked on something called alley details. Um, which has support for progressive enhancement, uh, alley tabs, which are highly accessible tab lists of things uh, that lay out in different ways. Um, and then the media player and, and well, there's GIF too, because even solving simple use cases like this, right? Like we could detect that the user was going to upload a GIF and then we'll take it and go, oh, well, it's a dot, it's a dot GIF. You're not supposed to just have motion graphics that are playing nonstop on loop that the user can't influence. So then having, even just having a simple web component wrapper around that to say, well, this isn't, this is no longer a dot GIF file running here in an IMG tag. We're only going to allow that to run when the user actually clicks and says, I want to run this mm -hmm. GIF. Um, the, the color, spectrum part I can at least show in the way that it ends up uh, resolving the UI. So this, this is hacks on the, on the side. And then there's a setting that is accent color. And uh, another setting is dark theme. So these come from the simple colors color set that, that Nikki basically took web colors and said, uh, we've got level one through 12 of orange, and then level one through 12 of blue and green and all, all the rest. But by having this spectrum of defined colors, we can say green, and then we can say, oh, well, it's, is it in dark mode or light mode? And we know enough about those colors that are gonna be made available that we can do seemingly simple things, but from an end user that's a non-technical user perspective should be magic. Like they don't know that there is a certain color contrast ratio that must be achieved so that when I say, oh, well, that is a, certain level of brightness green in the background, okay, it needs black text in front of it and vice versa. Um, so I'd say that's probably one of the bigger accessibility wins we have that we can then justify in the name of, not that you have to mm -hmm. justify that, but like you can easily 
pitch it to someone else as far as like, well, this is like a branding consist, you know, color consistency type of a thing. Um, but really what they're getting is we're doing, we're able to have an element that encompasses all the math associated with like, all right, we know we can hit WCAG 2.0 or 3.0 AA standard or whatever of color contrast ratio when you use color six and then, oh, well, color six needs to be pegged with color one as far as background or something like that. Um, what we actually used a lot is we had um, this site because a lot of our old portlets use bootstrap and we've slowly been, or they've slowly been transitioning over to more modularly using material design. So this is a little site that Google made. It's kind of a similar thing where it shows their entire, I have two monitors. It shows their entire material design palette and you can click one and it'll tell you what secondary colors go with it and which ones are um, accessibility. Mm. Yeah, this is the thing I was trying to pull. Nikki's doesn't look exactly like this, but it is a similar type of a thing. Very cool. Yeah. And it's, it's nice with, I mean, you can do the same thing in, in React components, but, but with web components, um, the connotation that a web component can, can have, you know, knowledge of an encapsulated state. So it can know that it's in dark mode and, and react to it. It can, you know, if it's in dark mode, okay, well, I know that I need to flip the colors and then I need to analyze what the current font color is uh, to make sure that it's uh, accessible. And if not, I'm going to change that. Yeah, and there's a second tab up there to the top left where it shows you an entire, yeah. yeah. Maybe Nikki borrowed it from here or they borrowed it from her. I don't know which. It is very similar <laughs> chart sheet. You pick a yeah. color. And then it, it has that pop up over top of it and actually shows you what the, the uh, color contrasts are. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of different, different ways that we end up resolving with accessibility. Um, uh, the biggest wins we've had that kind of shook our, our disability office, I'll say, was they, um, they, saw, they saw an article, of course, somewhere else. So we were working on this hacks thing. They're like, oh, you know, we'd, if people are going to use this, we'd love to audit it, like make sure it's accessible for them. Like, yeah, that, I mean, mm -hmm. it was in development. That, yeah, it, that was what it was at Open. That was the accessibility auditor on the, um, we, our version of View Portal is called MySale. And so the MySale team, I was the ADA auditor person. Mm -hmm. So um, just, the, and they came back and identified like 53 issues or something. And the vast majority of them had to do with what was an underlying button component that just didn't have, it, it didn't correctly associate title text to the button. I, it was associated to, uh, I think a tool tip, like an actual tool tip tag. And so even just resolving that in one location and pushing it out, they were kind of like, uh, we'd like to see more of what you're describing because <laughs> no, 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 no one else here is building applications in, in a way that's traceable that way. Um, now there are, there are a lot of, unfortunate long diatribe type articles about how web components are not accessible, um, which usually have to deal, uh, deal with uh, like form values. Um, so there is a lot of stuff you have to take into account associated with forms, form state. If you have a form mm -hmm. field that's inside of a shadow root, it won't, mm -hmm. it won't uh, render necessarily. Um, so, uh, or do you have any specific accessibility concerns with them? Uh, specific ones I can think, not at the moment. Um, sorry, I was just removing some obscurely long name from the chat channel that did not look like it was a human um, <laughs> before, oh boy. before a webcam flipped on on our recorded call. Um, <laughs> awesome. So what are you doing? Um, are you still doing U portal stuff or? Um, I do a little bit of um, just public contribution a little occasionally. I'm actually at a different school now. I'm doing a pharmacy program. 
Mm. So I did work with the um, IT department at Oakland as an undergraduate, and I'm a graduate student now. So it was about two years ago now was when I left that job. So it was fun because I, for about a year and a half, I was the accessibility person who was in charge of essentially keeping a giant spreadsheet of here's all of our services and my sale and Oakland's main site. Here's when we should test them, what's been tested, how it's been tested. If we need to talk to legal for any reason and say we've made conscientious efforts to be ADA compliant, here's the proof. It was, it was an interesting job. It was fun. You did that as an undergrad? Yeah. Wow. You must have been busy. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a fun challenge. <laughs> That is definitely something to put on your resume. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I covered accessibility over, uh, I guess it was two weeks the one year because I had someone from the disability office come in that did run those types of reports, even just informed. Cause I, I teach a web class. So even mm -hmm. just informing students that this is a concept for some of them, they're like, yeah, I, I've heard of accessibility, but most of them, no idea what it was. Yeah, it's funny because what they told me when I first started doing it is they said that they said, Corey, if you do your job right, you'll be the most hated person in the office. I didn't know what they meant <laughs> until later when I realized, oh, because I'm the person who says, oh, we're ready to push this new UI view. And I'm like, are you? Let me take a look. <laughs> it always be at least one thing. You kind of have to be that guy if you want it to be done, if you want accessibility to be a thing they actually achieve. I mean, do you want to be loved or do you want to do a good job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. All right. So if we have nothing else in accessibility land or anything to talk about, um, I'm saying we should call a wrap for today. We've got 24 minutes, which I don't think is enough to cover uh, any topics. We have a bunch of topics that are up here for tomorrow when we hopefully reconvene and do the same thing. So, Thank you all for attending Hacks Camp Aperio. I'll see you next year. And by that, I mean literally here tomorrow on Zoom where I live all the time. <laughs>